a very obedient lot you all are. Good morning. <laughs> Sorry, not good enough. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, my name is Helga Henry. Uh, you may have seen me in other conferences such as Hello, Digi Hello Culture 2011 and Hello Digital 2009. It is uh, an enormous, enormous pleasure to welcome you all today to Hello Culture 2012. Um, a day today, we've got, we're in here all day today. It's going to be a fantastically inspiring, innovative, and useful, we hope, as, as much as anything, useful insight into two realms that we want to talk about. Today is all going to be about collaboration and investment. Now, a few faces I recognize from last year, and it's lovely to see you. So it means I can't tell you what I said, I can't tell you what I told you last year, which was I love that this is called. Hello Culture. And I love that this is part of the Hello family of events. And that's because the word hello was invented for new technology. The word for hello didn't exist until the invention of the telephone. Uh, until then, you'd say hello or hey, you know, you didn't say hello. And there was a battle between Edison and Alexander Graham Bell as to what the word should be to signify that you'd picked up the phone. And Alexander Graham Bell wanted ahoy, as in a ship. Uh, which is why Mr. Burns on The Simpsons, don't know if you've got any Simpsons fans here, which is why Mr. Burns on The Simpsons always answers the phone and says ahoy, ahoy. Because, you know, he was, uh, he was an Alexander Graham Bell man. Now, I hope you didn't notice there that I said it doesn't give me the opportunity to tell you a story that I have just actually told you. But I do love it, and I think, for me, what this is about, the word hello, and the fact that it was made for a piece of new technology, is very much at the heart of what we're going to do today. Because what we're going to do is talk about new ideas and new concepts for which, perhaps, we don't have the language yet. Which is why, sometimes, we resort to language we already have that sounds a bit silly. But I guess hello sounded silly at one point. Um, so, but in the theme of looking at words, today's words, it's like Sesame Street, today's, today's conference is brought to you by the words collaboration and investment. So I can see some people from the library. You might not be able to answer this question. Uh, does anyone know the derivation of the word collaborate? Don't be shy. OK? Latin, no classic scholars amongst us. Col labore, to work with. Col meaning with, labore, to work. Working with one another. So collaboration, really quite simple. What I loved, however, was the derivation of the word investment. Does anybody know where that comes from? Again, don't be shy. OK, so investment came originally was about when you got a new vest. You got a new set of robes. You got a new livery. It was to be clothed in the official robes of office. And what that then became was that when you got a new job that got you more money, you tended to get a new outfit. A bit like me, I've bought a new outfit for today. People shop, hello, out on the internet, people from people shop. Um, and then over centuries, so by the 16th century, that 13th century meaning had become about the notion of giving your capital a new form. So investment talked about taking one thing and turning it into something else for profit or result. And I think that's very much the theme of this morning. We're going to be making some investments, some real investments. I'll talk to you about this in a minute. We're going to be making some investments that are going to be about taking cultural organizations' assets, the cultural capital of different organizations, and giving it a new form. And that's going to give new life to that, that, cultural, that cultural capital, give it new opportunities, and new opportunities for revenue, revenue generation. 
I don't know if some of you are on Twitter, uh, you'll have seen, you read the news, you know, we're even if you, I don't know, read newspapers. Yeah. How analogue is that? Um, but you may have seen the news today about Newcastle City Council potentially cutting all of its funding to cultural organisations. We are in an unprecedented set of economic, you know, economic hardships. And we really have to now collaborate and invest in new forms and new ways of working. The other thing about today, if uh, for those of you who are fans of the US, and even if you're not, it's still true, um, it's Thanksgiving Day. It's Thanksgiving where the Americans amongst us will be talking about and probably tweeting ad nauseum about what they're thankful for. But I think maybe that's another spirit of, that we can bring to today, that we can, in a spirit of gratitude, think about all the opportunities that digital might give us to bring, to kind of open our minds to the possibilities of what collaboration we can bring. So, today, I hope we kind of, we're ready to hear some great ideas, invest some money. Bugger quantitative easing, we've printed our own money. You have, in your delegate packs, hello credits. Um, this will be for, uh, just before lunch, when you've heard all of the people who are pitching today, when you've heard their pitches, you will be able to invest in the company that you sound, like the sound of with your hello credits. Lara and I were over overruled. You're not allowed to tuck it down the pants. You have actually got to put it in an envelope. Little word about this. We have a judging panel who we'll talk about shortly. Um, uh, who are also going to make recommendations. Your vote will not be necessarily... Your vote is influential, but I think law, the judges amongst us would say not determinative. Your votes will influence the recommendations, but I'm afraid they won't be... It won't be a popular vote. This isn't the X factor, or strictly, or any of those things that you vote in. But we will take account. It's a good notion. It's a good sense of how popular... Uh, a pitch has been in terms of the ideas. We have a panel of judges who are going to make recommendations, but the ultimate decision maker, the Simon Cowell star maker, as, as it were, <laughs> is Matt Sanson. <laughs> Before we introduce that, I just got a couple of three points about um, housekeeping and some other stuff about today. Um, it is a digital conference. You are welcome to tweet, surf, check on Facebook, do a few emails, whatever it is, you know, I know you all do in those seats of yours with your smartphones. Uh, the Wi-Fi today's old library, we're in here all day, and the password, wherever you are for Wi-Fi, depending on the space, is nice custard, as indeed it is. Nice custard. Uh, if you're tweeting, I'm not going to be a hashtag, doc, you know, hashtag, you know, dictator. It would be nice if it was Hello Culture, but you use whatever you like. I know some of you don't like to be told what hashtag to use. But the Twitter handle is Hello Culture 12. We also have, dotted around the room, um, a QR code, for those of you who like that sort of thing, um, and a, uh, a little uh, URL which ends Hello Survey. That is a survey about a few... Um, a few of the, the themes, the ideas, the stuff that we're talking about today, and as people fill in that survey, it will be updated with a really snazzy data visualization, which I can't, which we can see over in the corner. It's that in the corner there, you can just see a little some pink squares floating about. Once we start to get answers to that Google survey, those will update live. You'll get live updating of data. You data geeks out there, that's go and feast on that in the breaks. We'll be showing some screenshots from time to time. This morning is primarily going to be about our investment game, our exercise, where, you know, Dragon's Den style we have a panel of people who will make recommendations, and Matt has real money, not this stuff, some real money to invest in an app that might be used. I know, it's fantastic. Even your iPad is clapping. It's marvellous. Got some lunch, a couple of cracking panels in the afternoon, some really great speakers and some great content, then some speed networking, 
And then, after a few thanks, a chance to network at more leisurely pace, preferably with some alcohol. Um, a quick hello uh, to all you people out there who are watching the live stream. It's better here, but it's nice that you could join us on the internet. And uh, if, you're watching, if you're watching at home or wherever, uh, send a tweet in and uh, you might get, we might be able to read out uh, stuff in various breaks. So, at any point, if you've got any questions, uh, find me, find your friendly big cat stuff, um, and we can do what we can to help you. But without further ado, I, I'm going to just introduce a few of the key players that we have for this morning's panel event. Uh, first of all, as we said, Matt Tanson from IC Tomorrow and Mitra Mamasia from IC, to IC Tomorrow. But also, some of you may remember who used to be Mitra from Birmingham. Uh, Mitra is a fantastic curator, artist, um, producer who has um, become increasingly involved in working in the digital realm. And she is an absolute exemplar of somebody who brilliantly brings the aesthetic of culture and the slightly new world of digital and marries them together in a way that we can understand. So I'm really thrilled that she can join us today. Our august panel, I won't do any, you know, here's the Craig Revel Horwood of our own panel because I don't watch those programmes, so I'd only be, you know, I'd only be lying and making it up. But I am absolutely delighted to welcome Anthony Tatton from Big Cat, Peter Murphy Burke from... Um, from Arts Council England, West Midlands, Lara Ratnaraja, Clayton Shaw from Sampad, and Simon Whitehouse, freelance digital consultant, who are our panel. Can we have a round of applause for them? Um, welcome to all the people who are pitching this morning. I'm sure she, you're all thinking, will she just shut up so we can get on with it? So I will just shut up and we can get on with it. Um, I would also like to welcome in the usual fashion, Matt and Mitra. Matt, are you going to kick off? So, can we welcome Matt and Mitra? Thank you. Good morning. Hopefully everybody knows. I want to, I'll do some very quick introduction and do some quick background as to um, why we're here and who we are. Um, hopefully most of you already know this, but in terms of the Technology Strategy Board. Technology Strategy Board is the UK's uh, innovation agency. That's much better. There we go. Um, I have to excuse my throat, I've got a bit of a cold moment, so I'm going to talk slowly and very strangely. Um, so we're the UK's National Innovation Agency, which is all, uh, was founded in 2007. Um, it works across business, works across universities, works across government, um, and really is all about sort of encouraging innovation and, and hopefully improving kind of UK economy. Um, most of the people within that organisation are actually from a business background, uh, and the budgets that they're operating on are something in the region of about 300 million a year. So they had a billion over three years, and there's actually 390 million for next year. Um, some random facts and figures. They've invested more than two and a half billion with various companies. Um, for every pound they invest, it brings back seven pound back into the UK economy. We ran 50 competitions, over 50 competitions last year, and we've got 50, 60 competitions lined up for next year. Um, we've invested in over 3,000 projects. We've worked with 4,000 companies, 110 universities. Um, you can tell I'm not doing this by memory, but I'll keep going. Um, more than 50% of those were invested with SMEs. We do a lot of work actually with sort of smaller startups, micro studios, in the kind of sort of, and sometimes even pre startups, and I'll come to that in a minute. And we invested more than, um, like I said, sort of 60 million in those kind of small businesses via an SBRI scheme, which is a kind of procurement program that we operate. Um, we've also had more than 9,000 people turning up at various kind of TSB events. So it's quite an interesting organisation and quite a broad organisation. Um, it operates everything from sort of creative and digital, but also through sort of low carbon vehicles and nanotechnologies and medical. So it's, it's got quite a broad remit. Um, there are a number of different tools that TSB operates in trying to sort of engage with communities and engage with kind of companies and, and people, and they range everything from sort of you know catapults through to various things involving kind of you know, KTNs and KTPs and SBRI programs. But actually, one of those programs, more specifically, is IT, IC Tomorrow, which is the program that I'm program manager for. Um, we tend to operate on the smaller end of the scale, so we tend to do sort of small interventions, little and often, really. So we we tend to do sort of small funding opportunities, really, everything from sort of 5k up to about 50k. Uh, we run a number of competitions. We run, I would say a funded competition every other month and sort of in between those months we tend to run these sort of digital opportunities which is one of these things so it's not just about sort of running competitions and, and funding for prototypes it's also about putting the right people in the right room which is exactly what today is all about um, 
I'll give you some example, we, um, obviously this today is, is, is great, but we also ran one in advertising. We had 110 applicants for sort of 24 places, and we ran this kind of speed networking event around digital agencies, and that was very successful. Um, there are also a number of things that we do. So apart from the competitions, like I said, it's, it's, we do a lot of sort of facilitated networking. So hopefully, we, well, we work with a number of content owners and rights holders, and we work with a number of digital developers and innovators, and we're expanding the program to also work with kind of sort of funding and, and investment community people. But the idea really is, just, like I said, to put the right people in the right room. So the point of what we do in terms of running kind of challenge-based competitions is that we work with those challenge partners, identify a sort of particular challenge within that sector, work with them to make it more generic so that hopefully the challenge, the solution that comes through is, is, is more appropriate and more applicable to maybe not just one kind of challenge partner but also potentially across sector. And then we sort of, you know, we work with them and hopefully introduce them to the relevant companies and then we fund the prototypes and we fund the development. So more specifically, um, culture is one of those kind of competitions, one of those sectors that we've worked in and I'll, I'll pass you over to Mita in a second, you can tell you more about specifically what we do in culture. But we are very keen to kind of work cross sectors. so we've worked in film and TV and music and publishing and games and, and various other things and we, we're very much about trying to encourage people to think maybe not, you know, if you can build an application for a, for a publishing company or for a games company or for a music company then you can build one for a cultural organisation or you can build one for a well, for any other company race. Really. So the idea is that sort of hopefully there are transferable skills that we can help encourage. And by putting in a little bit of funding, like I said, little and often, and, and funding those prototypes, we can help people get to the proof of market stage and then leading through to the kind of commercialization stage and hopefully help people kind of unlock new and interesting markets. So that's what we do. Hopefully that all made sense. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I am really excited to be back in Birmingham. Um, I left about a year and a half ago, but um, keep very close ties, and it's really, really great to be doing this here um, in sort of my old hometown. Um, yeah, as, I suppose, as, as Helga said, um, I kind of uh, had many years here as an artist and slowly started to kind of move towards digital uh, more and more in the last few years, um, mainly because my art practice is always about connecting people, and that's kind of essentially my role within IC Tomorrow um, that I started last January. So I kind of went into IC Tomorrow as a sort of cultural um, consultant to work on um, one specific um, project at the time, which was digital innovation in culture, which has kind of now been running and running, and I'm kind of eking it out and doing more and more things around it as we sort of go on. Um, but I also kind of, um, we all sort of cross-pollinate, as Matt said. Um, we um, tend to kind of look at various different sectors and what's happening in them. Um, and because we kind of, we, we've got this kind of Googled out, Google Earth um, view, we can see where some of the opportunities are sometimes that maybe some of the kind of digital companies might not necessarily be aware of. So that's a really important part of what we do. Um, specifically in culture, um, I think digital is just really exciting uh, at the moment. Um, I think it just it offers so many um, kind of new opportunities really to explore um, you know, new audiences um, uh, and nationally, internationally as well. Um, so it's really exciting to see a lot of the um, kind of ideas that, that come to us. Um, with this particular one, um, it was quite an open brief, really. Um, we just, um, working with Lara, um, we decided to look at this concept of transforming culture through digital, and really that was the call out. Um, so it was quite a simple application, I hope, um, and very, very kind of um, short word limits. We really believe in that at, at IC Tomorrow. We try and kind of keep things um, quite brief so that actually it's quite light touch and it allows for people to kind of actually expand on ideas so we're not being too prescriptive. Um, and we had a really great range of um, applications through, um, and you're going to hear the, the kind of top 10 this morning. Very excited um, to hear them. So, um, I mean, just to give you an example of some of the past things that we've done, um, we've also been working with uh, Birmingham museums and art galleries, the public, so the ones that are kind of regional to here, um, uh, as well as um, places like the National Museums of Scotland. Uh, just to give you an example, for, uh, the Design Museum uh, Challenge was around collective campaigning and fundraising and Sticky World, who's going to be uh, actually, I think they're on a panel tomorrow, um, they're going to talk about that project. Um, and what's really exciting is that it's not really just about that kind of fund, and I think Matt did allude to that, it's actually about that relationship. Um, and I've got a really great quote, which I won't be able to say word for word, but from uh, Josephine Chanter from the Design Museum saying that actually working with Sticky World on that prototype um, meant that they could take a risk, they could do something that they hadn't actually, they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, but it's also shifted their entire digital focus, which is quite amazing when you think about it. It's, it goes beyond that 24K, actually, what that means in terms of a legacy, what that means in terms of kind of where the design museum might take 
their kind of um, digital strategy is really, really exciting. And that's something that we, we're kind of really proud of. And uh, we want to kind of tell those stories more and more, really. Um, so I'm not going to keep you. Um, I'm going to finish there. Uh, and just to say that um, the presentation is going to be 10 minutes. Uh, it's going to be five minutes presenting and then five minutes questions and answers. We want to make this as interactive as possible, so really want to involve you, you guys as well. Any questions that you have, it's really great to get those conversations going, get that dialogue so that you're not just kind of sitting there and it actually makes it a much more kind of um, exciting and involved day rather than kind of sitting there. So I hope you've all had your coffees um, and you've got lots of energy. Um, so we're going to step aside and I think it's Capture going up next. Okay, thank you. Can, I, can everybody hear me okay? Mic, mic, is the mic working okay? Okay, hello everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, my name's Abby Enoch, I'm CEO of Capture Limited. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do and a lot more about a product that we've got that we're really hoping to do something exciting with. So who are we, first of all? We're a really enterprising UK technology company. Our software helps bring digital assets to market. Um, we specialize in the cultural sector. We have lots of great clients, including the British Library, the National Maritime Museum, a host of others. Um, I won't mention them all here. And we, we work in other sectors as well. So we have very big guys, and, but also we have very little guys as well. So we cater for you all. What do we do? Um, we build cloud-based uh, digital asset management business and e-commerce solutions for all these organizations. We also, interestingly, provide outsourcing services um, for, for these organizations too. In other words, we can actually run the systems for them. Um, we're experts in, in um, all aspects to do with digital archiving, metadata, keywording rights, copyright licensing. We've been doing all of this for years. Um, and we also do high capacity hosting, training, consultancy, and the subject of today's um, presentation, we have a little product called Capture Desk. Um, so Capture Desk is basically an online project toolbox for image researchers. Um, it can save up to 50% of, uh, of their time from their traditional way of working, and it does many things, including flowing in metadata from other sites. Um, it approaches licensing from the picture buyer's perspective, and that's what makes it really interesting. Um, it makes licensing images from multiple sources really easy, and it allows customer-designed license plates to, 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 to license templates to be applied. It's software as a service, and um, actually we developed it a while back in 2004 um, because we're quite a forward-looking company, and we saw these very problems that are now in the limelight emerging then, and there's also a patent pending on it. So this little video here just shows you a tiny fraction of what it can do. So I'm in the project view here, and I'm selecting a project. I've now gone into another site, into Corbis, um, to, to, to do a search outside the system for, for a, an image. I found this pony. I think this looks ideal for whatever I'm looking for. So I'm going to right-click on it and send it to Capture Desk. Um, I can then now, I can choose now where to send it to in my project organizer. Um, so I'm going to decide here to send it to one of the folders in the structure for the book I've created. So I'm sending it to chapter 8. Off it goes. Um, go back into our project viewer and have a look in chapter 8. And you can see that the image has arrived in there. And if you click into it, you can see it's brought in automatically all the metadata and caption information, um, lots of keywords and IPTC information. Um, and um, uh, it's also applied a default uh, license template to it. And that's a, a template that I, the picture licensee, would have set up. You can write notes about images and chapters and various stages and use it as a, as a real collaborative tool. So now we come on to the bit where I have to explain how this fits into the grander scheme of things. So I'm going to uh, try and summarize this in a few short sentences. So over on the left-hand side, um, we have our Capture online system, which is existing technology. And um, the, the main things to point out are that part of it is, is, is a rights holders database, an assets database, and a rights users database. And um, 
It also links in, can link in with um, PLUS and other registries. So there's a, a lot of stuff in there. It also has many other tools associated with it, but that's the main thing to impart here. This blob here, if you like, represents independent people actually running our systems, um, using this, but running them separately on their own, perhaps like the British Library or the National Maritime Museum. And over here, this blob represents other systems that may not be running anything to do with capture at all. However, because of our API and connectivity functionality um, uh, for, for these guys, and also obviously for our own systems, they can, uh, uh, all the information and meta and, and images can all flow into one back office system where it can be aggregated. So this is basically going to be the aggregator for, for the search mechanism. Um, over here, we've got um, the pink blob, are digital assets which are right outside the scope of all these things, but these can also be brought into our little capture desk system. So in the middle here, we've got Capture Desk, where the licensees can create their projects, build up their books chapter by chapter, and then they can go off and do an aggregated search, if, if they choose, across all this content that can reside here. And um, because that's then linking in with um, Pick Scout and Plus and other registries, um, it will also help bring up um, information and help identify sources. Um, or they could go over here and do an independent search and do a right click in the way that I just showed on, on the demo previously. So when, when all the content's been amassed here, then they can have light box, remote light box meetings, collaboration meetings with editors. Finally, they reach a stage where they decide which images they want to clear for licensing. Um, they can agree prices through Capture Desk. And then very importantly, through Capture Desk, they can then buy all these images from many multiple sources through a common interface. So therefore, avoiding all the complexity of, of the market. Right. Next slide. Um, so all, um, all this is existing technology. This exists as well, but needs enhancing. So that's really what we're looking for there. So we're looking for partners to enhance the system and um, help us with standards and market it, and importantly, champion it. So this slide really su summarizes what I've just been talking about. I won't go into it in great detail. Essentially, the cultural sector could agree a common licensing experience across a whole range of sites, keep your independent pricing, and give the buyer a, a, a smooth, um, uniform process, avoiding all the complexity of today. Obviously, all, video, all, all content types would also be handled, and uh, we'd be able to look forward to uh, respond to future licensing types as well. So in terms of strategies, um, Capture Desk is unique in, in that it really is a customer-driven digital content copyright exchange, DCE. So it could become a driver for implementing standard licensing. Um, it will make pricing more intelligible and transparent. Um, it will enable demand-led innovation, helping standardizations of new licenses, which are, are sure to crop up uh, as we move forward. And also for multimedia projects, uh, in enable granular tracking of all the different elements that can go into a multimedia media project. Um, it will also um, it, it help good practice, which is clearly so important moving forward that we, we do have good practices to take us forward in, in a good, strong way. And a, as a side benefit to it, because in the background, as, 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 as the aggregator, um, we, 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 um, we will be using the Capture Online platform, it means that actually smaller institutions could be aggregated into that and actually get online in a way that they could never afford to if they all had in, in, in individual systems. So there's a lot of sort of separate added on benefits as well. Um, the team behind the technology, we are a great team and we're very proud of the team. And um, we have all kinds of skills. Uh, not only, um, you know, we have a, a digital preservation scholar, uh, someone else has a PhD in digital archiving. And we're a very empathetic technology company. So we really sort of bring technology to our clients and give them a great experience. And that's part of our mission, not just great technology, but a great team behind it. Um, so um, thank you very much for listening. There's a couple of quotes there from people to leave you thinking about. Um, do ask me any questions now or obviously afterwards. I have my colleague Nick Hodder also with me as well. Right. So what is the business model for this? Or your business model in particular? Well, in terms of, of monetizing it, you mean? Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, so what's the business model in terms of this particular thing and monetizing it? The business model at, at, at the moment is... Pit, is um, picture buyers who want to use it, basically they log on and they, they buy a monthly subscription. However, going forward, I, I, I'm not necessarily suggesting that at all. Um, we're open to any, any options, including, including a royalty, you know, a, a, a minimal royalty um, payment scheme.
Uh, hi. Um, hi. Do you know what the appetite or demand for something like this is in the market? Uh, um, market research is part of what we, we would like to do on, on, on this, but uh, I mean, we, we all the time work with picture researchers. We don't build anything without talking to them. They demanded that, that, that we did it for them in the first place. Okay. And, um, but we, we, you know, it really needs something like this. It, it's a mass thing, so it, re it really needs sort of marketing and a, and a mass approach. And, but people using it won't give it up. They absolutely love it. They're saving 50% of their time. And some publishers actually will only work with picture researchers who are using it because it makes their projects so much easier to track and manage. Okay. Uh, my question is about scalability. Yeah. Would this um, be relevant for small arts organizations or is it just bigger institutions? Well, it would be relevant for both. Indeed, it would, yes. That's, that's one of the beauties of it, really, yeah. Hi. Peter stole my question because she looked oh, over no. my shoulder. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'll elaborate on my question that Peter yes. stole from me. Um, um, do you actually look at the rights of people that steal questions, actually? Um, it's going back to the scalability of, of smaller arts organisations yes. because I can see how the revenue model would work for, you've, you've talked about very large venue base, we've got the, the Library of Birmingham here. Have you considered actually what are the new ways of de developing new revenue models for smaller arts organisations? Yes, indeed. Uh, what yeah. is it then? That, well, uh, it, it, I don't know if we can go back to that, the, 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 the diagram. I mean, but the, the aggregation platform that we're using is our own platform. And because we're, we're using a system to, if you like, reference some of the bigger guys who will have their own individual systems and the right, you know, um, financing for that. But the, the actual, pl there's no reason why smaller guys couldn't, if you like, be contributors to, 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 to if you like, sort of back office system. And then, and then there's a whole load of tools that you then might benefit from that would be part of that. I mean, editing tools, finance tools, licensing tools that are, that are all there. So I, I saw that as actually a really good part of that. That you. must mean something. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Jake Castles. I'm from The Connected Set. Uh, we're a multi-platform production company. Um, and this last year, we've been uh, we're pretty busy in the cultural space, thanks to uh, direct commissions and also some funding from IC Tomorrow. Um, our first offering in the cultural space was actually Take Britain Quiz Trail. Sorry, I did the 16-9. I thought we were going to be so it's all a bit squashed, so apologies for that. Um, but hopefully, you can see what, what we're trying to achieve here. Um, Take Britain Quiz Trail. Um, was uh, a, a, an iPhone app that allowed players to explore the gallery on a themed trail of artworks. Um, players could uh, answer questions to earn prizes um, that they could then redeem at Tate Online Shop. Um, uh, you can share your newfound knowledge about the artworks as you uh, travel around the gallery. You can play it at home as well, and you can even share your prizes too. Um, Take Britain um, Quiz Trail uh, smashed its download target in, in month one, and we were actually picked up on Apple uh, as number one new and noteworthy, so we're really pleased, pleased with that result. Um, although we've produced very distinct uh, products for all um, of the cultural clients that we've worked with this last, uh, last year, um, they're all basically built on a proprietary platform that we call Quiz Trail, um, and this Quiz Trail platform allows cultural institutions to build an affordable, engaging, fun, location-based smartphone game. Um, new features can be added pretty easily. Um, so for Cast Sculpture Foundation, we created a non-linear trail, which allowed um, visitors and players to check in at sculptures along Exhibition Road, the v &A, Science Museum and Natural History Museum in any particular order to find that information and to find out questions and, and those kind of things. Closer to where we are now, for Birmingham Museums, um, we're releasing content episodically. So if you download this today, you'd see there are three trails available for you. But there are future trails for different venues that will be released between now and spring next year. Um, and there's a, a couple of reasons we wanted to do that to 
generate repeat usage of the app um, and also release content at appropriate times for the specific venues. Uh, the re re there was a reward mechanic uh, in each of, the, each of the games and that basically helps um, the, the mu museums and cultural organisations to test out a new business model. Um, you can issue vouchers and prizes that people can redeem online or on site to drive sales. Um, Cascopter Foundation extended this to, to, to produce a prize draw um, to generate some buzz and also allow a data collection mechanic so you could uh, uh, collect data um, and use that for either personalization of the app or, um, or to collect it for your own marketing purposes as well. Um, but we also do other stuff outside the Quiz Trail platform as well. This is released today. Um, <coughs> on uh, Android and iPhone is the Epstein Mysteries, uh, which challenges players to solve the mystery surrounding the shooting of Kathleen Garman, who was, uh, if many, many of you might already know this, but he, she was Jacob Epstein's lover. Um, and the game basically asks you as players to unlock hidden archive and listen to testimonies of suspects to solve the mystery as you tour the uh, Garman Ryan collection at the New Art Gallery Walsall. So please download it today. That's the, my little plug for today. It's from this link here, it's j.mp forward slash epstmist, um, and that's for Android and iPhone. Um, and there you are, unlocking archive at the, at the thing. So what's, what makes us uh, innovative at the connected set? Well, we've got a full-time team uh, who are responsible for research and development and innovation. Um, we have a vast range of experience coming from various different disciplines, um, TV, publishing, gaming, mobile, and we've also got cultural and curatorial uh, people as well. Um, yeah, we, we want to work with clients and we often facilitate and arrange brainstorms to generate new and compelling and fresh ideas. Um, and we'd be really interested to work with any of you um, uh, and any of the projects that you're wanting to develop. We're interested in the funding session that's happening tomorrow. So, uh, so yeah, if anyone would like to t talk to us about that, we'd be very happy to speak to you. Um, I'm going to the speed dating thing tonight. So I've got some icebreaker questions if you want to either ask them now or at the speed dating event tonight, some of the areas that we're particularly excited about in the cultural space. So you either note them down now or use them as prompts in a second. Um, but uh, that's it from me for the moment. Um, yeah, I'd be very pleased to answer any of your questions. Thanks very much. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I've actually got a question, Jake. Sorry. Um, That's all right. Uh, okay. Hi. Um, uh, just wanted to know a bit more about particularly the one that you were looking about, the uh, location-based story game. What are you doing in terms of uh, trying to understand more about the usage and monitoring the usage? And what are the drivers behind the actual game itself? <laughs> So, are you talking about the Epstein mysteries? Uh, no, the one you mentioned before. Oh, the, the, the quiz trial ones, yeah. platform. So, we, we install analytics in all of those, uh, those games. So, we're measuring, so you can measure all the sort of usage levels in terms of session times. And, um, and we actually drill down to specific location that you're playing at, the kind of trails that you follow, whether you get questions right or wrong, what kind of products that you buy at the end, or prizes are redeemed, and that kind of stuff. So, we can provide loads and loads of information on, on usage in the actual platform as well. Thank you. Uh, it's kind of a supplementary to what you've just, uh, what Clayton's just asked. So what's the ratio to earned points to redeem points that you have on, on that game? And are you seeing a time lag between them? Are you seeing people coming back afterwards? Um, in terms of repeat usage? Repeat usage, and so are you seeing people coming along, earning the points, and then coming back a month or so later and then redeeming them, so they're returning back to the same venue? Yes, yeah, I mean, we are seeing a good level of repeat usage. Um, it does depend on the kind of prize offering. I know with Tate we experimented, and we were able to, they were um, able to give us an increased prize, and we were able to put push notifications out to try and encourage um, uh, increased redemption. Um, so, yeah, we are able to sort of measure all that. Um, I'm getting to be the person that asks about money because neither of these two will. Um, okay. How do you see again, for me, the thing about the collaboration with the arts organisations that I know you, you work with BMAC and people like that is where do you see the revenue model for the organisations that you work with 
as well, not just from an audience loyalty point of view, and, and I can see from the, the Tate model how that works in the New York Gallery of Warsaw, but are you looking at more developed kind of income generation models with the arts organisations? Is there other ways they can kind of exploit their assets through this sort of technology? Um, well, to to monetise it, I mean, I think the obvious way that we, we want to help people monetise it is through that reward mechanic. Um, and Tate and or BMAG as well, actually, um, uh, once, once you complete a trail, you're, you're given a prize, and that can be uh, money off um, uh, at the cafe or it can be money off on the gift, at the gift shop or online. So hopefully that will drive sales. But there's also product uh, carousels in, in, in the Tate Britain one, so you can sort of drive particular products that you want to promote, those kind of things. Great, hi. I just wondered what the level of interaction is available. Is it mainly a sort of broadcast platform or are you getting user-generated content, comments, etc.? Um, at the moment, we, um, we ask for people's feedback, but we, we haven't actually developed a, 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 a format or a, a feature where people can actually produce their own <coughs> quizzes. We'd like to be able to do that. That would be brilliant. But we, yeah, that's, that's not something that we have done so far. But we'd like to talk to someone about that. That sounds a good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Jake. If you were to win today, how would you uh, use the funds? Um, brilliant. Well, I mean, it's kind of going to the question here. We'd like to continue to develop the platform so that we can then continue to offer, um, you know, enhanced uh, features to clients that we're working with. So things like being able to offer user-generated content, also enabling organisations to manage, because it's all built on that content management system, enable organisations to manage that content themselves. So produce a front end for, for a content management system as well. Uh, just to expand on that, I guess, really, I mean, given that you, you know, sort of the organisations and the companies that you've worked with in the past, if, in order you're going to do another prototype or you know, another relationship, what would your ideal partner be like? Who are you looking for in terms of this prototype, this, this time out? Um, I mean, it's interesting because at the moment it's basically it's about content for us. So we're looking for a partner, it doesn't matter what size they are, but if they've got a brilliant collection or they've got um, brilliant stories to tell, like for instance the New York Gallery of Warsaw, we were able to bring out a brilliant story about Jacob Epstein and his wife. So we're really looking for someone who's got a great story to tell. Hi, are you considering any kind of storytelling mechanisms? Um, in the quiz uh, uh, In the part for the museums that you were mentioning and the interaction between the people and the live feeds and all that? Have a look at the um, Epstein Mysteries. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that's exactly what we're doing. So there's audio testimony. It's very much a storytelling game, okay. that one. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Have a look. Thank you very much. Hello, hello. Oh, thanks. Um, just very quickly before we kind of go to the next presentation, just to sort of clarify some of the rules for everybody to save me running backwards and forwards across the line. Um, we will be sticking to the 10 minutes pretty sort of strictly, as you might have noticed, but to be fair to everybody, if you're in the middle of answering a question, you can answer, you can answer the question that you're currently being asked. Um, but I said in terms of your, your Q&A session, your presentations have to fit within those 10 minutes. So if you keep talking for 10 minutes, then these guys are not getting a chance to answer questions and that will affect your scoring, I suspect. So just sort of be aware of the timings. You'll hear the kind of clapping noise at five minutes and you will get cut off at 10. I mean, bear in mind, you can finish your current question. Okay, thank you. So you be repeating that 10 times. Hi there, my name's Victoria Forrest, I'm from Cluster Publishing. Um, it's a new company that looks into the design and development of interactive publications. Uh, my background is within uh, book design, print, and branding, and as you probably know, the industry is going through a bit of a hammering at the moment, and it's very important for me to be aware of how my clients are developing into GPS-located events and iPads and how this is going to move forward. Um, one of the kind of most obvious places where this moved over was um, within arts festivals. So every couple of years I work with an arts biennale called Worcester Wall Biennale. We have the same problem each time. What are we going to print? How many of them? Who's going to have them for free? Who's going to pay for them? Who's going to put the posters out? How are they going to be distributed? And so a GPS located app within a phone where people can navigate and be aware of where they're going and how 
is a perfect way to do this. Um, it fits perfectly with the system, and they were very excited at the idea of it. The problem is, why isn't it everywhere? And the main reason for this is, if I can have the next slide, please, is the cost. For arts-funded um, for arts funded people, it's very difficult to be able to raise the 10 to 20,000 pounds that it could be to develop a custom app. So what um, I've done is, as well as creating a prototype that allows people to move through the space, I've created a, a duplicatable scheme, which means that this can be used for any grants-funded application and for any GPS-located um, festival. So I'll go through the design, and then perhaps it'll start to become more clear. If I can have the next slide. We usually have the same problem with print. How do you filter your information? Is it by diary? Is it by artist? Is it by venue? How are people going to get around? With an app, you can have three tabs on the top. So this design allows three tabs on the top, and this information can be filtered as follows. So if I can have the next one. The first tab, the diary tab, you have a calendar. Click onto your dates. Lists everything that's happening that date. It's clear. It's about the design. How is it going to work? You then go to your portfolio. You have your portfolio. You have your artist and then you can learn everything about that. You'll know exactly where they are, you can put them to favourites, you can have your GPS. On the bottom you've got your back button, you've got information about the stats, you've got your favourites and you've got your GPS, so you'll always be able to know where you are. It works together with print, we still want to keep print, but it's working in conjunction with it. If I can have the next one. The artist tab, again, you're listing your artists, same system, it's easy to follow. List your artist, quick introduction and then bang straight th through to your portfolio so you know what you're looking at. Um, and if I can have the venue, again you've got your venues listed, you've got your venue detail and then you start to get into the GPS so people can move around. So if you have this, this is your HQ, there's your HQ and then if I can go to the next one, you're able to choose your favourites. So you then, um, obviously you have your favourite section, you click on here you go through to your favourites and you can plan your tour in advance. So you can go on the train, you can have the distribution, they can download it a week before the festival. You can have a real good read through what they want, choose their favourites, so when they arrive they know where they're going, how they're getting there. And if, if I can have the next one, if you've got your, your area with your GPS. Now Whitstable is an example where it's not got a great Wi-Fi system. So it, getting, getting things downloaded can be tricky. So if it's, your GPS isn't working, there's a map in there so that you can always find where you're going so everything's on your phone. And if your, your little chap isn't following you properly, you can go through there. Um, can I have the next one? OK, so um, looking at the, the structure, the structure um, is, like I say, it's designed to be duplicated. So people can keep their own branding. If you saw on the app, you've got a very distinctive brand. People can have their own font. You have their own colours. You can make sure that you keep your, your, your uh, festival's brand throughout. Um, the pricing structure, I've put in an initial investment. We've, for the short term, we're looking at 10. If we get 10 people to get 10 products, we've covered our initial investment. From that point on, we want to continue the collaboration. So if people start to... it's good, we're, try and keep it at five grand each and then um, if people start to reinvest we can then put the money back into the systems so we can have favorite features if people want to have increased um, Google Analytics which is a massive part of this is to be able to follow people around to be able to have people instead of having people on door counters you're able to know exactly who's downloading what where and when which also helps them get more funding in the future so it's really vital for them um, you can also add on kind of bolt-ons where you have links to local businesses, increased favourites, and some people have even been talking about um, having a two-tiered system. So if I can go to the next slide, please. This is your bolt-ons. Okay, and then if we go, go through to the next one, this is the testimonial. They love it. I mean, it's worked, it exists. I have a handout here, there's a QR code on here, you can download the app. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it to questions, I suppose. Thank you. Um, hello. Hi. Is it e-commerce enabled and can you sell tickets? Pardon? Is it e-commerce enabled and can you sell tickets to uh, festival Well, tickets? I mean, that would be probably one of the bolt-ons. It's designed for arts-funded and arts council-funded places, so they often give them away for free. Yeah. So it's part of their funding. So this would be part of the kind of bolt-ons that you would add in. So, yes, you can look at local businesses. You can have... 10% you know, off this cafe and this cafe if you want to go in the area or you can sell it or you can if you want to do the advertising side you can this 
particular example was, is designed more for the kind of cultural side. Sure. But certainly you can add that if you want to. Great. I'm glad that you've uh, faced the mobile beast straight <laughs> on. Um, my question is about content update. Of often festivals change, programme change. Are you able to update yeah. constantly? Yeah, you can do, yeah. And is there any cross-marketing function? So I happen to be going to Visual Arts uh, Festival in London, but there's also one in Birmingham the next month. This is where the two-tiered system comes mm. in, which is what people have been interested in, where you have a regional area, say the Southwest, and they have all their festivals that are happening in the Southwest. You have one app for that, and you have your basic specs. And then you download the next app, which is the detail. So that would probably work with the two-tiered system, if right. that makes sense. Thank you. Um, just thinking about the target groups for something like this, is there a particular kind of or type of festival that you think would work better? Or are the types of festivals that you think are going to have, a, a, have difficulties in adopting this kind of technology? Um, or what's, what's the main focus that you're looking at? Well, the main thing is, is really the design of the, of the template that can be adapted. So in terms of festivals, they've all got places, they've all got artists, and they've all got venues. So that tab system follows through to kind of whatever you want to. Um, like I say, it's designed for kind of arts and, and culture, but it can certainly be, certainly be moved over to other people as well quite easily, I think. It's just if you've got the content, I think you'll be able to work out how to, to fit it to the structure quite simply. <coughs> Hi there. Um, I like the, the simple clean interface that you've got on the, on the app. Okay. When I downloaded it, I had a problem because I wasn't able to get the, any of the images through. I wondered with the Wistful, Wistful Biennale, how, how many people downloaded the app and did you have any, any feedback about any problems that they had with it? No, actually quite the opposite. We had people coming back to the Biennale saying how successful it was and how happy they were with it. So that's really interesting that, and I'd like to know more about that afterwards. Um, so what was the first part of your question? How many people downloaded it? It was between two to five hundred, I think, and they were very happy with that. They also didn't push for it, which is something we've really got to kind of teach them to do, is really have people at the headquarters <laughs> saying, this is how you download it. If you need to update your network or your, your system in order to be able to have this app, this is how you do it, and really kind of push, not just put a QR code, but teach people how to download it. You'd be surprised how many people don't even know their password. <laughs> Just one last question. How many people go to Wistable? It's difficult. Well, this is, do you know what? This is one of the, one of the really big problems with the Google Analytics, uh, the, the, the advantages of it. They don't know. People never know. You can't measure how many people are in there. So I know that they will print two, they'll print two to 5,000 leaflets, but we don't know where they go. We don't really know. So it's, it's a massive kind of gray area in terms of being able to count footfall. So it's been very useful. Um, I'll give credit for the person that asked this question, Julia Higgimottom over in the corner. Um, what she wanted to ask was, was there any particular reason why you've gone for a, an iPhone app or an Android app as opposed to a really good mobile website? Yes, so, because people can walk around and have it with them and it's, it's a much more personal way of holding it. So, what, what you, so what's the... Well, it's, a, it's, it's an app based because you can walk around with a good mobile site as well on an iPhone. Right. So, was there any particular reason... Well, no, I suppose is the short answer to that. It seemed to be the most um, practical way of doing it. I have access to the software programmers that are able to do it, so maybe it was a more the practical side of that. Just very quickly then, in terms of the sort of content updates, who can do the content updates? Is that, do you guys have to do the updates or can that be client done? We would love the client to be able to do it, but at the moment it has to be done through the, through the programmers. Hi, so have you uh, built a C uh, CMS system that uh, updates for the Android and the um, Apple um, iPhone? Yeah, it's for both. Okay, cool. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Do you want to pick up one of these? Am I on? Yeah. Right, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we are Gamer, and we are someone on the PowerPoint. Yeah, next slide. 
We are an opportunity to both strengthen, strengthen the connection between yourselves and your audience and also deepen their participation in your exhibits and your events, but also an opportunity to extend your existing revenue streams and actually develop some new revenue streams as well. Um, so quite literally, we are a gaming platform that allows cultural organizations like yourselves to easily create educational games using mobile technology. Um, we use location-based technologies, we use augmented reality and visual recognition to create games that encourage visitors to interact with your exhibits, both before, during, and after their visits. Um, so through engaging stories and exciting challenges, um, which actually link to real-world objects, we encourage your audience to participate more fully in the exhibits that you have, and both uh, do that through play, um, playing the games themselves, and help them to discover more through the uh, games themselves, and also to connect both with yourselves and the wider world. Um, so next slide. We do that by focusing on producing fun educational games that encourage interaction with the real world, and that's what we're all about, is interacting with the real world, not having your head down in your iPad, but actually with the real world itself. So next slide. So who are we? Again, we are um, a complete game studio, um, and we have all the tools that we need to start working with organizations like yourselves right now. Uh, in terms of revenue models, we have a number of models, which means that we can work with organizations of any size. Um, we have low overheads for updates as well, um, and we even have the potential for revenue generation if that's something that fits in with your strategy. Um, but whatever the model, um, I'd say that either way, working with us is an intelligent way to spend your digital marketing budget. Um, so I'm going to focus a bit more on the benefits than the features. Um, so working with Gamer, next slide. The first and I think the most important thing and what we offer is that a deeper and more engaging educational experience. So to give you an example, we built a proof of concept for the British, British Museum, and it's this mummy here. So when you go up to the sarcophagus and you point our, our app at the sarcophagus, it kind of animates, comes to life, and it gives you a bit of information about how they had these things called canopic jars, and that's where they kept the lungs and the liver. You have to click on one, you have to go and find it in the museum, snap that, come back, and once you've got all of the bits and bobs, they go into the mummy, mummy goes to heaven, everyone's happy, and they're learning. So it's richer content. <laughs> It's touchable, it's context sensitive because it takes people around the actual museum itself. Um, and next slide, the thing that's really important is it just increases engagement. People get really excited by this stuff. They're playing, but they're learning at the same time. And you get these, we, I mean, a good example is whenever we go to the British Museum to check it, we get a crowd of people around us who are like, oh, wow, what's that? When can I download it? We really want that. And quite simply, we want to make them. So come and talk to us. Next slide. Um, and really importantly about that is that it's a huge promotional opportunity because people get excited by this stuff. It creates buzz. They want to tell their friends and they want to share it online. And then we build in all this other stuff like challenges and rewards and levels and achievements. And it makes people both want to tell their friends about it, but it makes them want to come back so that every time we br bring in new stuff, then they get a little update saying, well, there's a new game at, the, at X museum or X gallery. So they want to come back and play that game again. Next slide, please. Um, some other stuff which we think is really important is actually there's a lot of revenue opportunities here. Firstly, that we can use the games to guide people to your cafe or your shop, or we can guide them to specific exhibits. Um, and also, if it fits in with your strategy, there's an opportunity for paid downloads, there's an opportunity for in-app purchases, and further on down the line, there might even be things like location-based advertising, so local businesses, that sort of stuff. Next slide. Um, and actually, a thing that we think is something that everyone needs to start thinking about if they're not already is data. There's a lot of really, really important analytics that we can give you about where people are going and what they're doing and what's exciting them and what's not. And that can be used to drive your future promotional campaigns, which makes it, makes it more efficient for everyone. Next slide. Um, so how does it work? Quite literally, I'm going to run because I'm running out of time. Uh, it's a three-step process. We start off with a story. The story's at the heart. So we pick something that you think is popular. We build a story around it. We build some content around it. We select some mini games to kind of take people through those steps. And then we just assign locations or, or visual objects as triggers to trigger the certain uh, bits of content. Next slide. So to wrap up, um, we... Our, the opportunity to transform the way your audience in, interacts and engages with you and more opportunity for new revenue streams. Um, and I would say that we're here today because we want to talk to cultural organizations about what we can do. We're really excited. Um, and so if you're here and you have any sort of authority over your digital marketing spend, we're the people to spend it with. Um, your audience will love it because they'll be playing your games. You'll love it because they'll love it and we'll love it because everyone's happy. So come and speak to us, please. All right. <laughs> Is it that bad? <laughs>
I've been asked to introduce myself for, for the Twitter followers. So this is Matt Sanson from TSB again. Um, just one quick question. You talked about kind of location-based triggers. So what are you using for those location triggers? Um, so it's either the GPS in either a phone or an iPad. Um, that would be the location-based triggers. And then there's also visual triggers as well. So for example, if it's a painting or if it's the sarcophagus in the British Museum, by pointing it at that thing, it can be a trigger. Or it can just be where you are in the museum from GPS. But if you're using, sort of, so for internal exhibits, using GPS tracking, that's not necessarily as accurate as you're going to need to be. If you, I mean, what did you use in terms of pointing at the mummy, for example? The mummy is visual recognition. I think visual recognition is by far the most effective <laughs> thing because it can be about going and specifically interacting with that, with that exhibit or with that specific thing. And I find that, that people People, if you say you've got to go and find this jar and you've got to go and find this artifact or this painting, then they can go and do it and it's, and it's interacting with that, whereas the location is really a secondary thing. Hi, Anthony from Big Cat. Hi, Anthony. Interested in your, hi, your um, business model. So mm -hmm. how do you monetize as an organization? So yeah. do you um, charge for the app or take a rake from yeah. any, any revenues or a blend of... Sure. That. Well, the, the way we're currently working is there's a number of options, and we want to keep those options so that it depends on what the organization themselves are looking for. So primarily the first would be pay a certain amount to us to actually develop the game, and then there would be an ongoing date cost that's actually very low, and then the organization could choose to charge or not, depending on them, or there could be a slightly lower cost in terms of the initial development, and then we would have to do something, some sort of app download cost, which we would take a rake for. So we have a kind of part figure of what we think we need to make these things, and it's really up to the organization and their strategy whether they're happy to charge and whether we can take a cut of that so that we can get that enough money over time to make enough of a profit to keep ourselves going. As it's a new market for you, the, the smaller cultural organizations and culture mm. generally, are you going to um, be aware of a loss-making area at this point? Yes, first? so what, what we're really hoping is that everyone puts their magic $100 bill in for us so that we can use that £5,000 <laughs> to do something for someone and show how great this is. And do you do any digital hand-holding? Um, you're going to have to spell out what that means for well, me. Well, for people who, who've never encountered gaming techniques before, so small, Absolutely. Yeah. So effectively, you, you would download the app and it would be literally, go and do this, do that, and you wouldn't need to know anything about it. It would say, go and find the sarcophagus and point me at the sarcophagus, and then the next step would be now go and or click here and go and find it, and it's absolutely handheld. And we've, we've got a game that's actually about to come out in the, in the iStore that's not for cultural organisations, but it does do a lot of the stuff that we're, that we're trying to do, and it literally, it presumes my grandma could play it. Great, thank you. <laughs> Lara and Raja, I know I definitely won't be able to play it, but um, you've actually pretty much answered most of my questions, which now apparently makes me Louis Walsh on this uh, panel, um, which is very depressing. Um, but you, you talk about transforming the way your audience um, interacts, so you, you know, there's a bit of a demonist mm -hmm. kind of going on with the arts organisations. Mm -hmm. How can we bring the audience for arts organisations into this to start sort of defining what they like? Because I think it's quite interesting you said you as an to define it, but how can you almost engage the audience with, you know, Great question. Games Thank you for asking it. So a really important thing for us is that... Our, I'm Talisa again. <laughs> <laughs> our our long-term strategy is that we're a platform that other people can create games on top of. And actually our ideal relationship is that we'd work with you for six months to a year, we'd do this all for you, and by the end of the... the X amount of time, we would have taught you how to use our platform so you can make it. The derivative from that is that people can use it as well, that people could come to your organization and say, I think there's a really interesting story here that I want to share with people, and they could then go on our platform and use it. And that would be free for the end user and charged for the business or for the, for the you know, charity or something like that. So our end goal is to have a platform where other people can create these sorts of experiences so that we can step back and scale. Hi, Clayton from Sampad. Um, just thinking about the audience again um, mm -hmm. uh, and the longevity of a project like this, uh, is there a way that you... Uh, over the future, you could retain repeat visits or try and uh, in increase people's interest in using the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and a second question is, uh, semi linked to this one, is around the social aspects of a game like, uh, or the experience of, of something like this. <laughs> Are there ways that people can interact with the stories, provide information that can be shared on Facebook or Twitter or whatever? Sure. So um, remind me if I forget halfway through. So the first part of the question was, can we get people coming back and get them excited about repeat visits? And I think that actually, what we, what we want to do is we're, we're building more and more modules so that every time we bring in a new module, a new game, or a new whatever, then we can push updates to people and say, there's a new, there's a new trail in, in X Museum, or there's a new game you can play to unlock X in X Museum. Um, and I think that will drive repeat customers. 
Um, in terms of the social side of things, definitely, we want there to be a lot of Twitter and Facebook showing from within the app itself. And we also want to look to have other things where we can maybe, you know, have people tag a note on the wall around a painting or something so they can start to give their feedback. And there's lots of different innovative things we can do about social sharing, but we think that's really important. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Van Gusternel from uh, Lightbuzz and uh, I will present you Touring Machine. Touring Machine is a smart electronic tour guide for museums and archaeological sites. Uh, well, according to our uh, surveys, uh, we found out that uh, 9 out of 10 people believe that culture is an important uh, fact and that's why we are here. But 8 out of 10 prefer a unified and uh, generally better experience than the one uh, provided today. Uh, combine this uh, with the fact that uh, over 50 million people visit uh, the UK museums uh, every year, and you'll find out that uh, people really love culture nowadays. Uh, but how is the current experience today? Uh, the average visitor might uh, reach an archaeological site, search for uh, the nearby exhibit, search for any descriptions uh, describing the exhibit. Uh, probably the descriptions uh, are in one or two languages, um, probably one or two more. Uh, the user sometimes gets frustrated, uh, confused, and sometimes disappointed. Uh, Lightbus uh, fixes uh, this issue. We provide touring machine, uh, and we connect every unique exhibit with every unique visitor. Uh, how do we do that? Touring machine uh, is a platform that runs uh, uh, on every type of uh, smartphone devices, as well as tablets, the web, and uh, an augmented reality edition as well. Uh, it is always available. You have it right in your pocket, and you can use it uh, while visiting the archaeological site or while being at home. Uh, we use uh, a smart. Uh, the, we found out that uh, the most important uh, part of uh, guiding uh, is the descriptions. Uh, the visitors prefer uh, multiply, multiple types of descriptions, uh, so we have developed a description generation engine that has no pre-written information and composes all the descriptions on the fly. This means that uh, we can adjust the text of every description according to the visitor's age, interest, and demands. Uh, we, only, we only have a table of uh, data from the museum, and we can compose the description according uh, to that uh, data, and then enhance the description with uh, the GPS uh, values in order to provide uh, something unique, something that targets uh, uh, young kids uh, until uh, adults. For example, uh, we can uh, generate uh, uh, less uh, complicated descriptions for kids and more complicated descriptions for adults. Uh, furthermore, uh, we can uh, have a spatial expressions. Uh, using the GPS of the device, we know where the visitor is. Using the compass, we can uh, determine uh, where the visitor looks at. So we can generate descriptions such as uh, the exhibit uh, on your left, the exhibit on your right, and make comparisons between them. For example, uh, such as the store that you saw earlier, this temple is also made uh, from marble, for example. We are envisioning Turing Machine as a platform, as a worldwide cultural network. This means that uh, we do not create a tour guide for just one museum. Turing Machine is a guide for every museum. Any museum can join us and then uh, has immediate access to all of our smartphone clients, iPhone, Windows Phone, Android, as well as the web and the augmented reality edition. I'm happy to announce that uh, Turing Machine uh, will be launched uh, the uh, following uh, days. The international launch of Touring Machine, containing tours of uh, the Acropolis of Athens and the city of Athens uh, as well. We have been testing uh, our client for the past uh, few months and we are ready to launch. And uh, one more thing. What differentiates uh, a, real, a human tour guide to an electronic one is the ability to answer questions. As I told you, we have uh, created the natural language generation engine and using a Siri-like uh, experience, we can ask questions to our tour guide. I've got Touring Machine on my phone. Uh, I have the Acropolis tour I mentioned, and I can ask, uh, when was the Parthenon built? It was completed in 438 BC. 
and our guide can answer uh, in natural language using uh, the headphones uh, device. Thank you very much. Hi there, Simon Whitehouse. Um, so just totting up a few things there, you're using GPS, you've got augmented reality on there, you've got natural language processing and artificial intelligence, the compass. How much of a battery drain does it produce? Ah, sorry, how, m- how, much, how much drain on the battery does the, the app produce? It seems as though it's quite intensive. How long, li- how long can you use the app on, um, on a phone? Uh, how long? Without the battery going. Uh, so again, I didn't hear you. <laughs> so you're using a lot of um, a lot of the technologies on a, a mobile phone that use a lot of battery life. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. How, uh, it how, depends on the, its device. Uh, yeah. Uh, you can uh, for the moment you can have the device switched off, like this. You can have it switched off and uh, listen to the descriptions if you are moving around. Or when you are home, you can uh, turn it on and uh, view the multimedia, the 3D models, <laughs> uh, pictures, and videos. Uh, but uh, yes, we generally handle uh, the battery issues uh, quite efficiently. Um, just thinking about some of the uh, costs for the user, is it, is it free to the user uh, or are there ways that you try and generate income from uh, users um, just using this app uh, in a, uh, a heritage site or whatever? Thanks, uh, thanks for asking. Uh, we want the app to be free for the end uh, user. Uh, but uh, the museums and the archaeological sites that uh, are integrated uh, in our application uh, might have uh, limited uh, free or paid tours. This means that we can get a fee from the tours, as well as uh, commissions from uh, guiding uh, users to the nearby uh, cafes, uh, restaurants, etc. Uh, Peter from Arts Council. How much control does a museum or venue have on the descriptors that are used? Uh, well, uh, uh, descriptions uh, need to be accurate, as you know, so we give uh, full control uh, to the museum or the archaeological th- site or the general authorities. This means that we provide them with a content management system and they can uh, determine exactly uh, what uh, to be produced. Okay, thank you. We have also tested uh, uh, our platform uh, with museums and uh, culture teachers in order to ensure the accuracy of the information provided. Hi, it's Anthony from Big Cat. What um, functionality is lost during offline mode? If you lose connection, can you still use all or most of the application? Uh, That's right. Uh, Well, uh, when uh, you have no internet connection, you can use uh, part of the description language generation. And you cannot uh, do stuff such as sharing uh, with your friends uh, using Facebook capabilities and uh, something like that. But you, you still have the GPS, uh, you still have uh, most of the descriptions as well as uh, the multimedia content. And, and the maps, is the, the, the maps are still available or is there an offline map? Uh, we can use uh, both online and offline maps, so yes. Uh, Matt Sansom, you talked about sort of generation of the sort of content descriptions from the tables, and then you talked about sort of generating uh, different content based on sort of age range of the users. So, are you, so you're, you're sort of dynamically generating the content for the descriptions from those tables. Oh, are you? I guess is the question. Okay, okay start again. Um, you, you talked about the descriptions for the event. So you talked there, there was a table that was feeding into the kind of the the, the content that the user was going to read, yeah. and then you talked about having different content based on the age user. So you know, different content for kids and different contents for adults. So are you are you di- are you dynamically generating that content for those descriptions for the end users from those original tables? Are you doing that by hand, or is that being is that part of the process? Uh, it's done on the fly. I mean, this means that uh, okay. the user selects uh, if uh, he's a child or uh, an adult, and then we can adjust uh, the descriptions according to this. Uh, okay. Fact. So, it, but in terms of a sort of, a, if as a content partner, if I if I was if that's all automatically generated, is there a sort of is there a sort of QA step that you can kind of vet that generation of content and go, actually, that's not correct? And is there a sort of a, an element that you can modify it to change it to make sure that the right message is getting across to the users? Uh, well, you're just talking Sorry. about the... Um, uh, <coughs> so so if, if that content is dynamically generated and it's automatically generated, 
me as a as a you know cultural partner is there a step that i can check what that content has been created so that i can make any corrections yes definitely okay. um, of course this is something we want to make sure that uh, uh, every cultural partner will be able to check about it so when you feel using the content management system you'll have the ability to check out what uh, kind of descriptions will be generated okay like using it uh, right now okay and and in terms it's of the business of our, model it's part of our system yeah definitely okay great in terms of the business model you were talking about kind of free to end users so what's the business model and what's the commercial proposition for the content partners for the cultural partners uh, you're talking about the business model yeah right uh, so we as i mentioned before uh, we can have a free paid or uh, limited access tours and from the paid ones we can uh, have a small commission as well as a commission uh, from uh, uh, from the museums according to the number of the exhibits they want to present uh, in our system okay thank you anybody else Any other questions? Anybody? Uh, you you <coughs> described the problem of language and, in particular, not understanding the, the language on signs. How does Turing Machine fix that? Uh, may I answer? Yeah. Yes, yeah, the answer is yes, because we can uh, we support every Latin language such as uh, English, uh, French, uh, Spanish, Greek, Italian, uh, something like that, as well as Russian. Uh, we're still investigating about the Asian languages, which are a bit uh, complicated and a little different than the European ones. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Am I on? <laughs> so, um, five down, five to go. We've seen all sorts of interesting ideas, applications. Hope that's got some of you thinking about what you might be able to do, what that might make available to you. I used to help run a festival, so that sort of idea of having, we always, uh, you know, we predate, before smartphones were around, we'd have these piles and piles of print. <laughs> And then it was such a burden to get, I mean, great, because you wanted people to have them, but the person who ran it, Mark Ball, the artistic director, would just look at boxes of print and go, what are they doing here? Why aren't they out there? Where are they should be out there doing something. So uh, we always wanted something that was, you know, people could carry around and that you could update, particularly in a dynamic environment of artists going sick, falling off something, usually in our case, piercing themselves with something and having a coronary. Anyway, it's coffee time. I'm sure you're all ready for a quick refreshment. Coffee is out and at the back. Shout out to Natalie Hartland. Is Gailey Kay here or has she gone shopping? Oh, you've, you're here, good. Um, so uh, we're gonna make back a little bit of time. If you could be back in your seats at 25 past, we're going to uh, go again with the next five. More ideas, more things to be pitched to us. Don't forget the survey. Enjoy your coffee. Get chatting. Thank you so much. 25 past, back in here. Thank you.